Hello, my name is Andrew Westover, and I'm the key pairing director of education and public engagement at the New Museum. I join you today from the unceded land of Lenape people, and I'd like to begin by acknowledging and paying respect to Lenape people and elders and ancestors, past, present, and future. On behalf of the New Museum, I am glad to welcome you to today's panel conversation entitled Mediated Bodies with triennial artists Kate Cooper, Jess Fan, and Janine Frey-Najutli, and moderator Janine Bishops, curatorial fellow at the New Museum. Programs like this are core to the New Museum's work of advancing new art and new ideas. This program is presented in conjunction with the opening of the 2021 New Museum Triennial Soft Water Hard Stone, which is currently on view. The exhibition is co-curated by Margot Norton, Alan and Lola Goldring Curator at the New Museum, and Jamila James, Senior Curator of the Institute of Contemporary Art, Los Angeles. I would particularly like to thank Education and Public Engagement staff members, Andrea Calderes and Derek Wright, as well as the entire New Museum team for their help bringing this program together. New Museum public programs are generously supported by the Bowery Council and digital initiatives are supported by Hermione and David B. Heller. We also thank our supporters and members like you who help make these programs possible. I'll now share brief biographical notes about each of today's panelists. Kate Cooper is an artist who lives and works between London and Amsterdam. Her upcoming exhibitions include presentations at the Taipei Fine Arts Museum in Taiwan and the Fifth Aichi Triennial in Japan. Recent solo exhibitions of her work include Symptom Machine, SCAD Museum of Art in Savannah, Georgia, screen series Kate Cooper at the New Museum, Symptom Machine, Hayward Gallery in London, and Sensory Primer, A Tale of a Tub in Rotterdam, the Netherlands. Cooper's work has been shown in group exhibitions at Kunsthalle Dusseldorf in Germany, Palais de Tokyo in Paris, Stenter George Pompidou in Paris, University of Michigan Museum of Art in Ann Arbor, Michigan, the Stedelijk Museum in Amsterdam, Art Space in Sydney, Australia, and the inaugural Riga Photography Biennial in Riga, Latvia, and the Institute of Contemporary Art in Boston, Massachusetts. Cooper received the Ben Prize for Emerging Talent from B3 Biennial of the Movie Image in 2015 and the Sharing Stiftung Art Award in 2014. Jess Fan is an artist who lives and works in Brooklyn. Recent solo exhibitions of his work include Mother is a Woman, Empty Gallery in Hong Kong, and No Clearance in Niche, Museums of Arts and Design in New York. Fan's work has been shown in group exhibitions at the 11th Liverpool Biennial in Liverpool, United Kingdom, Socrates Sculpture Park in New York, the 22nd Sydney Biennial in Sydney, Australia, the inaugural X Museum Triennial in Beijing, Bangkok Center for Contemporary Art in Bangkok, Thailand, Hayward Gallery in London, Rockland Art Museum in Shanghai, and Parasite in Hong Kong. Fan has received fellowships from the Nitha Niska Artist Fellowship in 2020, Socrates Sculpture Park in 2019, Jerome Foundation in 2019 to 21, and was awarded the Joan Mitchell Painters and Sculptors Grant in 2017. Janine Frey Najutli, Van Tad Gwichen, is an artist who lives and works in Vancouver, Canada. Recent solo exhibitions of their work include Small Mounds of Flesh Form, Platform in Winnipeg, my Auntie Bought All Her Skidoos with Bead Money, Art Gallery of Burlington in Burlington, Canada, and Contemporary Art Gallery in Vancouver. Frey Najutli's work has been shown in group exhibitions at the Anchorage Museum in Alaska, the Vancouver Art Gallery in Vancouver, British Columbia, the inaugural Tor Toronto Biennial in Canada, McLaren Art Centre in Canada, Modern Fuel in Kingston, La Ferme de Busson in France, Art Gallery of Nova Scotia in Halifax, the fourth Contemporary Native Art Biennial in Montreal, Nottingham Contemporary in the United Kingdom, Camp Loops Art Gallery in Canada, and the New Museum of Contemporary Art Toronto. Frayne and Jutley received the William and Meredith Saunderson Prize for Emerging Canadian Artist from the Knightston Foundation in 2016. They are a co-creator of the Rematriate Collective. And now a few logistical notes before we begin. 
This program will last for approximately one hour. If you would like to ask a question, feel free to use the Q&A function at any time by clicking the Q&A button located at the bottom of your screen to type your question. Please note that this program is being recorded, so your question will be recorded as well. If there is time, our speaker will answer your questions during the program. Finally, I encourage you to learn more about upcoming public programs on our website, newmuseum.org. Now, without further ado, I turn the conversation over to Jeanette. Thank you so much, Andrew. Um, I'm so very honored to be here today um, to speak about the topic of mediated bodies. Um, and I'm very thrilled to be here with three artists who are all participating in the New Museum Triennial and whose practices I really deeply appreciate and admire. Um, this is a fourth round table discussion in a series of five that are held in conjunction with uh, the new Museum Triennial Softwater Hearthstone. that was curated by Margot Norton and Jamila James together with Bernardo Mosquera and with me. Um, it is on view through January 23. And I hope everyone watching today will have had a chance to see the exhibition or will have a chance to see the exhibition in person. And for those who cannot make it in person, we do still have some virtual tours coming up as well. And we have some um, one more roundtable conversation on uh, colonial legacies on January 13th. And um, that's moderated by Jamila James, and that would be together with Ansan Kim, also wrote an essay for our catalog and with um, triennial artist Amy Lean and uh, Tanya Lucan Linklater. You can register for those programs on newmuseum.org, and all past programs are up on newmuseum.tv and the events page on our website. And here you can also find the past roundtable discussions titled Fluid City from Death to Life that was moderated by Margot Norton. Um, and it was a conversation with Carson Chan, Krista Clark and Harry Gold Harvey IV. And roundtable discussion, uh, Softwater Hearthstone, but I know a change is gonna come. That was moderated by Bernardo Mosquera um, in conversation with uh, Gabriela Moreb, Laurie Kang and Rafael Fonseca. Today, we're going to be discussing some ideas around the theme of mediated bodies in the triennial. And we will be discussing this with three artists, Janine Frana Jutli, uh, Jess Fan, and Kate Cooper. And I'll begin by giving a brief background about some of the ideas behind the theme of mediated bodies and its relationship to the exhibition. And then I will move on uh, into presentation by each of the speakers, by each of the artists about the work and the practices uh, before we move into a discussion. And as Andrew mentions, if you uh, have any questions, feel free to drop them in the Q&A function as they come up and we hope there is still time uh, after our discussion or during our discussion to take these questions on. Um, so connected to the subject of mediated bodies, I wanted to give just a brief recap of the central theme of the triennial soft water heartstone. Um, when Jamila and Margot were invited to curate the 2021 New Museum Triennial, it was important for them not to approach this project with a theme already in mind. Rather let the theme uh, emerge out of what surface in studio visits with uh, artists during the research process, which was a process that I got involved with uh, during the summer of 2019. The title comes from a proverb that is popular in Brazil and found out throughout other cultures as well. Um, and we first heard this proverb from an artist included in the exhibition um, who is based in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, named Gabriela Mureb. And this proverb informed a work of hers that's included um, in the exhibition on the fourth floor. And talking to us about this verb, um, she translated the full proverb um, from Portuguese as soft water on hard stone hits until it bars a hole. Um, and this proverb is said to have two meanings, one which is about perseverance and persistence and the power that a small gesture can have in time. And the second is about these ideas of impermanence and inevitable change, things that we have all had to deal with these last two years already. And thinking about this idea, how over time um, it can change even the most perceptibly solid materials or solid constructs. Um, 
And so in the triennial, um, there are many artists embracing these ideas of transmutation, transformation, works that shift and work that dissolve, that are unstable or destabilize ideas of a static art object. And so in this triennial, as um, Eva Respini actually mentioned in our first panel discussion, um, it's very much, very much about reimagining uh, of visual orthodoxies, of social structures, our relationship to the planet and to institutions and how structures that we once thought, or thought should be stable or fixed are really in need of reimagining. And one recurring theme is the urgent need to change and to rethink notions that we are divided from Earth and from each other. And there are many works exploring this idea of how identities and bodies are constructed and constrained by systems of oppression, including the works by Janine and Kate and Jess. And me coming from this time-based media background, I was so excited to talk about this selection of artists whose work all kind of defied as limited static quality um, that artwork traditionally held and all of them somehow placed in the galleries uh, works that feel performance-based and their work makes us think differently about what a body can be and what it can do and find new ways to acquire agency within these systems of oppression. Um, and we can see some examples of that in the following presentations. So I am so excited that Kate, Janine and Jess are so generous with their time uh, to discuss our practice with us here online. Um, so I will now invite the speakers to present in their work and their practice in relationship to the theme of today. Um, starting with Janine Fran and Chutley, uh, and then Jess Fan and then Kate Cooper. Uh, we'll follow up with a discussion together um, so I will now hand it over to our first uh, presenter, our first artist of today, Janine Fry Nijutli. Welcome, Janine. Hi, Masi Cho, for having me. Adrian Lindsay, Shori, Janine Fry Nijutli Vajri. I'm a member of the Vantag Gwich'in peoples, and I'm also Czech and Dutch and have Jewish ancestry, and I'm Zooming in today from my homeland in Old Crow, Yukon, uh, which is situated in the in the Arctic right beside Alaska. Um, so I am just going to include a little link in the chat here. Uh, let's see. Here we go. OK, so I'm also I work. I also work as a professor at the University of British Columbia, and I'm giving everyone a little bit of homework. Um, there's also been a recent article that's come out in the Atlantic published by Graham Wood that's titled uh, Land Acknowledgements Are Just Moral Exhibitionism. And while I think land acknowledgements are absolutely important, we all need to be doing this work of acknowledging and understanding whose territory we're living on. Um, it is important that we think, we continue to think deeply about what our um, occupation of other people's territory looks like. So I'm really grateful to be in my people's homelands now. And uh, I would like to challenge everybody here to check out this website, nativeland.ca. It is not um, without its without its problems, but it also addresses that in the website itself. But it's a great uh, learning tool to start understanding about places where where you live or where you have visited. And then I would encourage everybody to also look up artists from those uh, those home territories. Just wanted to share that um, as a bit of my own housekeeping. Um, this is an, a recent artwork called Survival Romance that I created using, um, it's a tarp cast of a 2-6 of a liquor bottle. Next slide, please. This work is part of a knowledge transference series that I've been working on th since 2017, where I've pressed um, beadwork that family members have given to me. I press them into my body and then take a photograph. So this is uh, my grandma's Bible bag that I've pressed into my skin, which creates a temporary image. And, um, you know, I'm thinking about how like, invoking Monique Mahika's 
writing and thinking around blood memory <clears throat> and then also thinking about um, how different knowledges are embodied and with the tarp cast i'm of course aware of and thinking of and impacted by uh, david hammond's work and um with this one with knowledge transference this work was shown at uh, nottingham in uk as well um thinking about the legibility of indigenous belongings and our material culture and wanting to challenge a little bit of how our material culture is consumed. And um, yeah, with this one, I also have a, like a 16 foot by eight foot wall vinyl piece that I have installed a few times. One was at the Femme de Buisson, uh, just outside of Paris. And the other one, the other time I've installed it was at the National Art Gallery in Canada. And um, I've used, uh, I make my own contact microphones and will then um, turn different belongings. I'm using the term belongings as opposed to, um, it's hopefully, Quite a few of you are, from, are familiar with it, but there's this newer move in um, museum culture and anthro and anthropological culture to not use the term artifacts because that situates our peoples in the past. Whereas when we use the word belongings, uh, we're thinking about it acknowledges that our people are present and continuous, right? And that um, these belongings belong to people; they're not as um, dehumanized, and that link isn't as ruptured. So, um, yeah, thinking about the history and presence of these belongings. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so when I work with uh, what well, I call them sound tools, when I turn belongings or sometimes mass manufactured products or items into sound tools, I attach a contact microphone to them. And then um, for the knowledge transference series, I'll use the, I used a hide scraper, which is used for making um, traditional hide tan. Uh, for us is um, I turned that into a microphone, sang into it, and then I scraped the wall vinyl piece off myself. And that um, gesture of removing this image of my skin, which then becomes the skin of the gallery wall, is then sonified through using uh, the contact microphone. And then you can see here um, guitar pedals, a mixer, and then a guitar amp. Um, this piece is called, it's actually titled after um, some writing by Lee Miracle in, by the late Lee Miracle. I'm so rocked by her recent passing, as well as the wanting to acknowledge the uh, recent passing of bell hooks. It just feels really um, unfathomable and just holding space for people who are grieving, uh, grieving that right now. Um, so this piece, The Fiction of Zero, is um, a work that's titled after some writing by Lee Miracle and um, uses this symbol as a kind of like a gold pan. And I've um, activated it using gold beads in a performance at a Fearman Gallery in New York. Next slide, please. This work is, is um, on exhibition in the show at the New Museum. And um, there's a two parkas that I've sewn that have then been dipped in concrete. Next slide, please. And then this is an exhibition. This is also at the new museum and is my body weight in glass beads. And it's installed throughout, um, throughout the new museum. This is the second time that the work has been installed. And over time, it slowly, it slowly dissipates. It's impossible to um, gather up all of the components of this work again and thinking about um, how do we pull knowledge through our bodies how do these presences exist in in a space take up a space and haunt a space because of that impossibility of gathering the work back together again that these um beads i mean if you've gone to see the show some of them might have even ended up in your shoe already like um beads are sneaky 
I had, I was living with a beater at one point and uh, one of her beads found its way into one of my sandwiches. So <laughs> um, yeah, they are in a way permeating and will continue to permeate the institution. Masi Cho, thank you. Thank you, Janine. Um, then I will now invite uh, Jess to present on his work next. Thanks for coming here, everyone. Can I have my slides up, please, Derek? So in order to talk about the my work in the New Museum Triennial, I think I have to talk about the work in the Liverpool Biennial, which was completed um, during COVID. And, Practically not a lot of people managed to go to Liverpool to see the show, but um, it was my first time imagining the entire um, sculpture as a vessel. And specifically what's holding inside these vessels were a strain of black mold that were so eerily looks like, like Asian hair, like or black hair that I couldn't like I, I couldn't shake the thought of it. Like I, I just, once I saw it, I was like, I have to make work with this. And it, it's a, a type of black mold and it, um, it also aligns with my interest at the time of thinking about when does contamination becomes productive or when does the contaminant becomes the host, et cetera. So here's the new museum work. Um, visually, they're really similar, but also content-wise, they, they're also generated from the same organism. Or organism. Um, the yellow liquid inside the tubing is actually the, um, the spores, the liquid culture that was harvested from the spores of the same strain of black mold. And over the course of the exhibition, um, the, the liquid culture inside ferments, gets contaminated, um, reproduces, and it kind of, and this is the most recent picture that I took when I was visiting the piece earlier last week. So you kind of I like see it kind of grow over the course of the exhibition and um, it's like a living object um, in a way. Mm, can we go to the next slide? And yeah, and can we press play please? And if we're lucky enough, we like sometimes could catch like these little kind of um, uh, fungal bodies like moving like an elevator up the piece or down the piece or through its through its kind of cross sections. Next slide. And Janine, you're right about um, beads getting everywhere. As we're talking about contamination, like one of your beads, I don't know if you can see because it's black, like got stuck in the silicone <laughs> of the piece when I was installing and I just decided to keep it there. Um, next. And um, I wanna share a bit about works I'm doing along the same idea of um, finding hosts, finding contaminants and working with both of them. Um, this, so I haven't been back home. Home is Hong Kong. I haven't been back for three, two and a half years now. And um, this, I've been working with a scientist and a local fisher fisherman in Hong Kong remotely to breed this series of pearls out of the colonial moniker that the Brits gave Hong Kong, which is the Pearl of the Orient. And here you can see the Chinese character of the pearl being embedded in it and um, the, and the next slide. And over the course of the pearl generating uh, knacker over this foreign body, this invasion or this um, kind of contaminant, it just become, it just grows over it like a tumorous kind of um, coating. Next. And then this is the word of in Chinese. Next. And this is a word fang, which means like direction. And then the next slide. And this is a more obscure one. The pearl completely kind of ate over the word east. But um, yeah, and these images are now up on view at Kunsthal Trondheim and a good sh group show call, uh, called Sex Ecologies up till the end of this month. Next. I think that's the end of my slide. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> 
Thank you, Jess. Thanks so much for your presentation. Um, we'll now invite Kay Cooper, our last speaker, uh, to present her work. Hi, Kay. Hi. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. Uh, maybe, Derek, you can put the slides up. So I'm going to start by just um, really talking about the piece <coughs> in the exhibition. Um, this is a new video I made specifically for the triennial. Um, it's called Somatic Aliasing. It's an eight minute looped video. It's portrait format and it's, um, it's uh, over three 80 inch monitors. So it's about three meters tall. Um, it's in a gallery, which is kind of like a through space in the room kind of adjacent to Jay's work. Um, and it was specifically made for this, this space actually when Margaret and Jamila were talking about where I could um, exhibit a video in this exhibition, we came to this space. So I'm, I was really dealing with the kind of height and the kind of um, way the space kind of functions a bit. Um, and maybe if you go into the next slide. Yeah, so you can just get a sense of uh, the space. The video is a kind of CG um, X-ray rig that I worked with. It's a body that is kind of constantly in motion. The video is about eight minutes long and it's on this seamless loop. So it's um, the body's almost pulsated in this re repetitive motion, moving in and out along with this kind of intense soundtrack. Um, and I'm using a lot of these Foley sounds that are like clicks and, and uh, rings and kind of almost like crinkles of paper. Um, it's the sounds are very abstract, kind of triggering sounds, but pretty hard to distinguish what they are. There's a kind of rhythmic quality to the movements, um, although the sounds are more abstract, but the bodies are in this kind of perpetual uh, motion. The sounds and images presented in this video really relate to this idea of stimming. Um, Stimming being the self-regulatory bodily response uh, to uh, overstimulation by your environment. Normally it takes the form of these repetitive movements for the body as a means to cope. It's kind of like a bodily action, um, repetitive clicking, clapping, rocking, etc. Uh, and stimming is being interpreted as this kind of protective response in which people calm themselves by blocking out less predictable environmental stimuli to which this, they have this heightened sensitivity. Um, some people view stimming as a way to relieve anxiety and other negative or heightened emotions. And I was interested how to translate this kind of performative action and how that could be interesting for or useful for me in producing a video work for the show. Um, and th there's something quite common about this idea of stimming uh, and something I'm interested in is it's a kind of this in this neurodiverse response is um, it's taken up the, by the body as a way to kind of refuse or to, a refusal to participate. Um, this idea of blocking out an environment is a way of creating space. Um, almost in some ways, I think about the body in, in, on a, some kind of strike, or there's definitely this idea of resistance I was attracted to by thinking about stimming. Uh, so there was definitely, um, I was definitely interested in these non-verbal forms of communication and the potential of this video as an abstract medical body that could produce some kind of effects and in turn think of the video itself as a performance. And I think with this work, ultimately, I wanted to produce a video that was akin to stimming or producing this kind of stimming sensation when you experience the work. So the sounds in the piece are found sounds and sounds are manipulated, um, but they're not directly related to the body. And there was this process through making the work, which is trying to match sounds with images and vice versa as a way to kind of discover this kind of triggering affect as a kind of embodied physical response um, that you've experienced with the work. And for me, it was a kind of important frame of position, I think around these ideas of like a refusal of labor, refusal re re uh, readability of the body and instead finding a kind of alternative way to communicate by imagining how video could kind of act in such a way to kind of perform this bodily resistance. Um, so all of the image of these X-ray, CJ X-rays I've worked with, and um, I think in all of the work, if maybe you go to the next slide, uh, in some of my previous work, I worked a lot, I've worked a lot with CG images of uh, female bodies, um, but particularly with this work for the new museum, I was thinking about this idea of the X-ray um, 
uh, I was always considered this idea of representation um, or contested representation within CGI bodies. Um, but with the X-ray, there's this idea of a kind of image of undisputed information of absolute truth. Um, and what I liked about these kind of X-ray images, they become the space of pure information. There was a kind of emptying out uh, rather than reading an image. Um, and through this emptying out, I was kind of interested in how, what I could do with the work, what it could be um, understood to do or perform. So um, maybe... I'll just stop there. Thank you. Thanks so much, Kate. And thank you so much, everyone, for your incredible presentations. Um, yeah, I have so many questions. Um, but I wanted to start with how the subject today is about bodies, yet we don't see a lot of actual bodies in your works, um, especially in the works that are, um, that are up in the exhibition. And I wanted to zoom in into this idea of the performative in your works, yet resisting direct representation of your body or a body in general. And you're all kind of employing modes of abstraction instead in your own ways, like extracting maybe, maybe a bodily function or a bodily material and bringing this into the gallery space. Um, it disconnects a few from a specific body or source and in favor of something more amorphous or more difficult to contain, perhaps proposing new forms. Um, and I wanted to ask if you can all speak a bit about these ideas. Like I'm thinking about ideas of refusal to uh, opacity, like the Res by Glissant and negotiating politics of visibility. Um, and how in a way it seems like you're all wanting to escape the body. Um, and maybe we can start with Janine. Um, I wondered if you can ask, uh, you can talk a bit more about um, your relationship with the body and your modes of abstraction in your works, having these recurring motives um, in your works that are the parka and the hoodie, but also the beads uh, that we see in the works that are up in the triennial. And I was wondering if you can speak a bit more about these materials and your relationship to the body in your work. Thank you. Um, it's such a pleasure to be here today. I must see everyone um, for organizing this and for having us. And it's really an honor to get to be part of the exhibition as well. Um, and I realized that I took up quite a bit of time in my share about kind of like virtue signaling, but also talking about land. And for me, the land, the relationship between land and bodies are very intertwined um, and Lee Miracle, who I mentioned earlier, talks about how the talks about the relationship between resource extraction and violence against indigenous women, two spirit and queer people. Um, and with the with the work fighting for the title not to be pending, I'm thinking about land title. I'm thinking about the um, illegal removal of indigenous peoples from their territories across uh, what is now known as the Americas, what is also known as Turtle Island, and thinking specifically about um, Lambeck Lane, thinking about Wet'suwet'en, and thinking about um, not this the, thinking about this move away from the word protesters but uh what takaya blaney says um like pro, as uh, protectors as opposed to protesters and that uh, we are the land protecting itself and that as indigenous peoples like for me it was so important when installing the work for the new museum that some of the beads are embedded in the sidewalk and that it is challenging some of that idea of visibility or legibility in these urban spaces. And um, Pamela Norkby, who's now the um, Indigenous curator at the Met, talks about um, how there have also been indigenous metropolises. It's not like a new, something that's new to us, but that how we existed is different. And um, uh, Walter D. Mignolo talks about the colonial matrix of power 
and talks about uh, challenges, not decolonization, but thinking about a delinking of the colonial matrix of power. And so in some ways, I view this like dispersal of the beads throughout the exhibition space and then bleeding onto the sidewalk, seeping onto the sidewalk, claiming space on the sidewalk is um, maybe a way I'm hoping that in some ways cuts through thinking about that colonial matrix of power, like cutting through those um, architectural structures of an exhibition space or of a city space. And with um, the piece ache that's two parkas dipped in concrete, I'm also thinking, I'm thinking about land in that as well. And how um, like New York is an old, it's, Amazing, like for me, I spent uh, about 14 years in Musqueam, Squamish and tsleil -Tooth territories in Vancouver, and the building materials are so different there, depending because of what you have access to. And in New York, you're like, you're, it's skyscrapers, but you're also surrounded by land. Like to me, I'm like, concrete is just reconstituted mountain. Right. And so like, what does it mean to um, like, I wanted the parkas to feel heavy. I wanted them to feel like maybe they've been like dredged up from the river. Um, and then just thinking about this uh, connection, but again, like wanting to move past or like through presence and absence of the body, but um, definitely thinking about the connection to body and land. Thanks, Janine. Um, and then Kate, um, you've been working with these digital avatars and using imagery that you just showed was at first more like lifelike. And then over the years or over the last couple of works, the imagery, the imagery you've been using um, has become more and more abstract. Um, and I was wondering if you can speak a bit more about that in relationship to the body in your work. Yeah, I mean, for me, it's quite interesting because um, when I first started working with a lot of these CG avatars, it was also an idea of like uh, what they meant, almost like they were like ready made. What it, did it mean for me to use these works? What did it mean to, for me to kind of um, use them in artworks, this kind of visual language, these kind of objects, you know, that are kind of from this other space. What did it mean for me as an artist? So there's a kind of like a desire and also like a kind of violence in these images that I was kind of interested in. Like, where did I stand as a body? Where did critique stand? Where did um, my ability to have distance with them, you know? But like through the works, my kind of frustration with them being so um identified in a way because like I appropriate these models from um these different online uh, spaces you know and then bring them into artworks and texture them and animate them and all the rest of it but I was very frustrated with the kind of realisticness of them the fact that they were so identif identifiable became kind of a constraint you know um so I started by like making them bleed, making them vomit, making them sick. But then actually the more and more I've kind of moved into this, I moved into them being, um, as I kind of spoke a bit about being these almost like medical images, actually what happens if the images themselves uh, become completely empty, completely unable to kind of recognize it as a, anything other than um, this very um, uh, specific almost like human like nothing else is recognizable you know then what does that mean then there's this other potential to explore other ideas and what like a image then can do in relation to video what can it produce as a kind of function you know um and what that kind of an embodied function in relation to video what that kind of means because i think in the past when i was working with these cg uh, images that were so realistic there's always a kind of I was very frustrated with how they were read, like narrative reads as a kind of identified bodies, you know, and I kind of have more and more moved to this kind of abstraction, uh, which became more and more useful um, for me to explore some of these ideas, you know. Um, so yeah, it's kind of, for me, it's very, it, very interesting because the work kind of has moved into a very different um, uh, space in many ways. But I just wanted to mention, it's also nice that, um, 
uh, Janine's work. Uh, yeah, it's like also in all the cracks in front of my work. And it was super nice because I was there with my two-year-old who was like picking the beads out of all the cracks where we, we went to visit the exhibition. So I like that the works in the show all have this kind of dialogue with each other, that um, like the sound in my work kind of bleeds and there's the sound from another work. And I kind of really like that about the exhibition actually. Yeah. Yeah, I wanted to I want to um, engage with what you were saying as well uh, in later a question. But at first, um, I want to give Jess also um, some time to talk about his, um, his network glass sculptures um, in the exhibition um, uh, that uh, kind of question these binary concepts of, of race and gender and identity. And um, Jess, you've often used these bodily materials that have been gendered or racialized. Uh, like urine or semen, um, hormones. Um, can you speak a bit about the relationship with the body in your work and the materials you use as well? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think your first initial question um, talks about the figurative body and the absence of that in all three of our works. Um, not so much Kate's older works, which I lo love. The Hayward, the Hayward show was phenomenal. Um, and I, I caught some words, dispersing, bleeding, oozing, entanglement. And those are all that echoes in the way that I really think about my own personal body um, as a way of like, I always refer to my flesh as a sausage casing. <laughs> you know, it is just, I am just wrapped in flesh. Um, and, I didn't come to that reckoning until, you know, I grew up in Hong Kong and then I spoke Chinese, uh, Cantonese predominantly, and I moved here and I spoke English predominantly. And then just thinking through how Americans use like the word figuratively made me question, you know, what does the figure mean? Um, and I'm, I'm interested in that, like thinking about how do I revert, reverse the sausage casing, you know, like unbind it from its casing and then, you know, really tease out like an exploded diagram in a way, like what does this part of the sausage do? And what does this part of the sausage do? And in a way it, it, it feels um, what I'm doing, uh, it's just like almost like micros, like using a microscope and like going through the, you know, untangling it. It's almost like pulling the sign from the signifier in a way. And then like, what does it mean if the part only stands on its own? Like what weight does it carry? Almost like one of Janine's beads, right? Like what is this actual bead alone? Like what does it represent if it does sneak into my sculpture? And what if I never removed Janine's piece in my sculpture, right? I hope that answers your answered your question. I also really hope my cat meets your cat one day. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> Very pleasant. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, I wanted to actually loop in back to to what you were saying, Kate, um, because I've also had these, you know, walking through the exhibition and and having lived through that. Um, there's so many ideas of this of like uh, contamination or infection uh, in your works, but also like by placing them in that um, in that context of the exhibition. Um, and so you've all just been talking about these materials you use that have. Ha kind of have these abilities that traditional media do not have. Um, so some of the works might in the exhibition might act like more like a vessel containing something or holding something of importance and your works seem to be more like spilling out already over the space and kind of seeping and bleeding and permeating the space, but also the bodies that occupy the space, right? You walk through it and you have these beads under your shoes or, um, and then Jess, you've kind of been bringing these or, um, these organic materials also in your other works, um, sometimes almost like a Trojan horse, you don't see them in, in the sculptures, sometimes they're hidden. Um, but in the work for the triennial, it looks like uh, also this contamination is like literally happening, you know, the, uh, what you just showed, like the mold is like, it's, it's increasing and um, the liquid in, in the glass network 
that um, was at first very clear um, is now um, is now like more and more like becoming um, very blurry and um, the mold is growing. Um, also, it seems like in your um, I don't know if uh, the audience could see it in the pictures, but it almost seems like uh, the liquid is pouring out of out of your um, out of your work. Um, so yeah, I don't know if you can talk also a bit more about what what those those ideas mean to you and your work, like contamination and and um, and infection and. I, I guess I should go. Um. <laughs> Sorry, that's why it's a question for you, Jess. Yeah, yeah. Um, what does contamination mean to my work? Um, I I want to say, like, Kate and I were in conversation yesterday about this, um, how uh, because of COVID, like, that seemed to be in the collective psyche a lot, like, contamination and viral and but I, I wanna be clear that these were interests that I had prior to the pandemic that in my mother is a woman piece, I had extracted estrogen from my mom's urine and made a cream that I shared with my um, queer folks, like my friends. And um, it started with the idea of like, oh, how, if I refeminize my body with a mother's estrogen, is that natural? And that work was completely framed under like a trans, con like a queer discourse. And then now because of COVID, it's framed under like a different discourse of contamination and permeable bodies. Um, and, and, you know, it, it's been like thinking through the body as porous, um, as malleable has always been pertinent to my own practice. Um, it's not something that sprung up I mean, yes, of course, like living through COVID accelerated that thinking, but um, I'm more so interested in, um, you know, uh, I guess in the work, you mentioned Trojan horse and I was just thinking like, um, you know, like contamination is essentially fear, right? Like, cause it actually doesn't happen a lot of times in like a visual level. It is most of the time it's like a, a the fear of it that is the main um, contaminant. And I'm interested in um, like how how do I how does a material start embodying that fear, right? So in a project I did at recess in 2018, I was working with a group of scientists to make eumelanin out of E. coli and using E. coli as a host to um, generate melanin for an art project. Um, thinking at the time in 2018, I was already thinking through um, the, my cat's about to come. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Sabotage in there. I know. <laughs> um, in 2018, I was already thinking through, um, uh, Sorry. Uh, yeah, in 2018, I did a residency at recess, and uh, that actually in the basement there was uh, there's a video called Xenophoria where I was thinking of um, it traces the process of me making melanin with these scientists and finding melanin in non-human bodies and human bodies also like hosts, um, and. Uh, I was adamant in using E. coli instead of yeast, like both are just basic tools in kind of um, science. And because I was observing that the way we codify race or, or segregate race, um, like in the Jim Crow era where uh, uh, bodies of water is the most regulated, so in pools, water fountains, or like bathrooms. Um, the way in Hong Kong during the bubonic plague, right, the peak, like currently the most expensive real estate because of the legacy of the segregation um, is the most expensive real estate, like um, because during the bubonic plague, the Brits had only allowed white folks and one extremely prestigious Chinese person to live up there. And everyone had to be segregated under the latitude to prevent this kind of contamination, right? Um, so that that's why I was really adamant using E. coli. And then those those kind of uh, 
So I can go on and on forever about this, but I, you know, I, I, I think maybe I should pass the ball to someone. Um. <laughs> Thank you, Jess. Um, yeah, of course, uh, Kate, I'm also thinking about your work in, in several ways. Obviously, you've literally dealt with the subject um, infection in your work, infection drivers. Um, seeing it as kind of exploring it as a way of, of, of or a strategy of resistance. I'm also thinking about the way you use sound and how that kind of functions almost like kind of uh, taking over and taking up space and like kind of seeping through the building uh, when your work is um, exhibited. Um, so yeah, uh, I don't know if you have any thoughts on, on, on this theme as well. Yeah, I mean, um... I was, I mean, we also talked a little bit about this before, but like um, when uh, we worked together at the Stadelic, like um, I produced this piece called Infection Drivers. And in 2017, 2018, yeah, from 2017, I was really thinking more I'm coming at it from an image point of view of like this long kind of history of how like um, the, the, the idea of the virus as a kind of conceptual framework or as a distribution system is kind of interested in how images circulate, but also how we kind of critique images, right? So I was really coming at it from that kind of point of view and these thinking a lot about it as this kind of almost choreography um, and what it means kind of infrastructurally or again with distribution of images, you know, like what does inoculation mean? You know, what does it mean to use something against itself? And so I got really kind of seduced a bit by this kind of almost like metaphor, this like blueprint of how I could um, work with images, you know, or think about that conceptually how I work with images. So things like, um, uh, like, I just loved a lot of like the kind of um, medical terminology, like sanctuary sites, these spaces within the body that can't be like detected by drugs. It's kind of used in, in cancer treatment, you know, like this idea of being like hidden in plain sight, you know, was, was all these kind of terms were quite exciting to me to think about. Um, and then with infection drivers, with that work, it was also like uh, the image trying to sabotage itself in some way, or being frustrated that it was a, it was a, it was still an object, it was still a sub a subjective body, you know. And so I made this suit um, in CG, and this body is kind of both object and subject again. So she's kind of in this um, this suit and performing this almost like this. Um, sabotage of her own kind of constraints of her body you know so that was a kind of work I made thinking around those ideas so for me they kind of inform me more like um you know as an idea you know as a kind of um uh, yeah as a kind of interesting question to myself when I'm working you know as well as a strategy of working so uh yeah I think it's it's really it's really interesting I just wanted to mention one thing it it uh, Jay, your th that piece in Liverpool, which I saw, I realised <laughs> that um, that um, space in which it's shown in the Lewis's building, because I obviously went, because I'm from Liverpool, and um, I realised it's it's placed where the makeup counters used to be in Lewis's. So yeah, I didn't know if I told you that. What so. is that? What's what is it? What I. It that space where you showed that where it used to be like the hall with all the makeup counters or the cosmetics yeah oh, so really wow. I remember as being these kind of cosmetic yeah. counters yeah anyway I just thought I'd tell you it's kind of Thanks. interesting as you showed it I was like wow this space is quite loaded if you're from Liverpool right you know right space. right totally Which is, yeah anyway yeah such a good show <laughs> <laughs> yeah um Janine, I don't know if you want to chime in about this subject. You've obviously spoken a bit about how um, um, how the work with the, the beats in the in the museum uh, is kind of intended to kind of stick on to uh, other objects or other people. Um, I don't know if you want to um, yeah speak a bit more about that importance to you and like how do you see uh, these themes kind of related to that work, perhaps. Um, sure. Well, one thing when the pandemic first broke out, like I heard folks saying, oh, this is terra incognita. And I just um, was so couldn't relate to that, especially as folks who've like um, 
you know, thinking about the AIDS crisis, thinking about residential schools, thinking about uh, like Kim Tallbear, who's a Lakota thinker, has a really great blog around polyamory also. Um, and uh, Kim Tallbear talks about how um, like the apocalypse already happened for us. Like this is the post-apocalyptic apocalyptic time before COVID, she was saying this. Um, but then also thinking about um, Erin Marie um, Consmo's work, My Body is Not Terra Nullius. And um, of course, thinking about Felix Gonzalez Torres's work and his untitled um, portrait of Ro after Ross, right? And then thinking about um, just the different ways that my beads are installed in the space but then thinking about this candy and um felix gonzalez torres's interest in vi virality and the viral and then also um as somebody you know thinking about like the 80s and um like body politics and identity politics and what was happening then at that time and how um you know were what is like the viral and what is also the margin and how much um like people are just people but they become marginalized and then his like thinking about his desire or like just occupation of space is also thinking about the virus and um there's a different thing in like the communion of like sweetness and participating in that through his work than like crushing a beat under your foot or um like the concrete piece is sl will slowly disintegrate over over time too like its dust is also in your house right and then thinking about duchamp and thinking about like dust is um like a result of modernism and um or is like thinking that like dust is also like a colonial construct and wondering about that and anyway, we just like a little uh i don't know a little shock and blast of thoughts there but it's so exciting to hear more about uh your work jess and kate yeah. really enjoy same it. lines same lines yeah i think this is a beautiful moment to stop our conversation too i think we could have talked for hours um but we have to we have to wrap it up, unfortunately. Um, thank you all for joining us, this panel, also the audience, and for your presentations um, and your thoughts. That was really amazing, and I hope in the near future we can do that. This actually bodily together in person again. Um, so stay safe, everyone, and and thank you so much. It was amazing. Thank to you, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.